Yeah. Should I have the cut come down and grab pizza real quick? Do you have a window? Do you have a window or do you want like, to see them up here? Um, Fine, so right. we're going we're going live in exactly 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean Hey, Karina, how are you doing? Good evening.
Testing the audio. Yeah, I think it works. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, I'm always skeptical about my. No, it's perfect. Very, okay. very clear. Okay. Không có đấy của ông.
Okay, Karina. Testing, testing. How's the audio, Karina? Okay. Karina, can you hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. All right. We are live on Facebook and YouTube. Okay. And uh, here's, we have our, our other, uh, we have one more. Uh, let, me, let me get rolling in one second here. Okay. We're good on Facebook and YouTube. Is that right, Karina and Adele? I think we're good on Facebook and YouTube. Okay. We're going to be begin recording. Sister, are you good to go? I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, welcome back everybody to uh, another edition of Truth in Tradition sponsored by the Theology Department at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. We are delighted to have you with us now. Uh, many of you have been tuning in faithfully every week um, are on your 11th episode, I think. We've been going for almost three months. It's hard to believe. We, we began on May 12th with the Cardinal. We had Bishop Lopes a month later. And we have a very special guest, and I'm particularly delighted for our program tonight. Um, before we, we introduce her, why don't we begin with a word of prayer, and we can say a Hail Mary, which would be particularly fitting for tonight's talk. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So we've been, the, as you all know by now, truth in tradition, we're really kind of taking a sampling from all of the greats of the tradition, from the first theologian, uh, Irenaeus. We, we have John Henry Newman coming up. We've done Bonaventure and Aquinas. We've done Augustine. We have St. Ephraim, a church father, coming up next week. And this is just what we do. This is what we specialize in, being deep in the tradition. And tonight is, a spe is, is very special because we're going to the 20th century. And we have, th this will be a, a particularly enlightening talk in light of um, where we've come so far with the ancient and the medieval worlds. So 20th century will be a kind of a breath of, breath of fresh air. Uh, I'm particularly delighted to introduce our speaker, Sister Teresa Marie Chow Nguyen. She's a Dominican Sister of Mary Immaculate Province in Houston, Texas. I'm delighted because she's my office neighbor in the theology department at UST. She joined the theology department in 2017 as an assistant professor she earned her BA from the University of St. Thomas and her MA and PhD in systematic theology from the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. She has published in academic journals such as Newman Studies Journal, Marian Studies, and Maria, a newly launched peer reviewed journal of the Center for Marian Studies in the UK. Her book project, The Splendor of the Church in Mary, Henry de Lubach and the Teachings of Vatican II on Mary and the Church is currently underway. Sister, it's so it's really a delight to have you with us. Thanks so much for making time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the warm introduction and the prayerful beginning. It's a, a real delight to um, participate in this summer lecture series. So I will begin first with sharing my screen. And that should be vis visible to everyone. Just one second. Perfect. Looks good, sister. Okay. So the title of my talk is The Virgin Mary in the Nexus Mysteriorum Fidei. Let me start by clarifying the meaning of this Latin phrase, which as you see from its cognate refers to the nexus or the harmony, the connectivity of the mysteries of faith by which is meant the coherence of truths of faith amongst themselves and within the whole plan of divine revelation. Essentially, I will be exploring some insights which the study of Mary might contribute to this integral link between the mysteries as a whole. But first, some background. We find the expression nexus mysteriorum inter se, the nexus of the mysteries between themselves, formally employed in the dogmatic constitution 
on the Catholic faith, De Filius, from the First Vatican Council. In chapter four, devoted to the relationship of faith and reason, the council teaches, and I quote, reason does indeed when it seeks persistently, piously and soberly achieve by God's gift, some understanding of the mysteries, whether by analogy from what it knows naturally, or, and this is the nexus, from the connection of these mysteries with one another and with the final end of humanity. So Deifilius is saying that reason truly does know, albeit in a limited manner, by way of analogies and by way of the nexus mysteriorum. And the document continues, but reason is never rendered capable of penetrating these mysteries in the way in which it penetrates those truths which form its proper object. So the proper object of natural reason unaided by faith are those truths that are knowable by reason alone. When it comes to the truths of our faith, which are revealed to us by God, reason is incapable of a penetrating understanding, but not to despair, because it is still capable of some understanding while seeking persistently, piously, and soberly, either by way of analogy or by way of that nexus of the mysteries. The nexus mysteriorum is also referred to by the expression analogy of faith, an expression found in Romans 12, verse 6, often translated as in proportion to the faith. Here, Paul speaks of the many parts of one body, the church, and he exhorts the Christians to exercise the gifts they have individually received. If it is the gift of prophecy, then prophesy, quote, in proportion to the faith. The nexus mysteriorum is also applied to the biblical sphere. The Catechism of the Catholic Church reiterates Dei Verbum's teaching on the criteria for interpreting scripture in accordance with the spirit who inspired scripture. The criteria are threefold. The first is be especially attentive to the content and the unity of the whole of scripture. So we should not be reading a single verse of scripture apart from its context within that chapter or reading that chapter out of the context of the whole book or reading a particular book of scripture out of the context of the whole message of scripture. So this unity of the whole work of scripture. The second criteria is to read scripture within the living tradition of the whole church. So not only are we to read uh, for the whole message of scripture within that context, but we are to take the message of scripture as interpreted by the living tradition of the church through the centuries. And then thirdly, and this is here where we find the nexus again, the third criteria is to be attentive to the analogy of faith. And the catechism explains further, by analogy of faith, we mean the coherence of the truths of faith among themselves and within the whole plan of revelation. So the nexus mysteriorum is like a constellation of the many facets of God's revelation for the sake of our salvation. Centered on Christ, the word incarnate, who is the one mediator in the fullness of all revelation. He reveals to us that God is a loving father and he sends his Holy Spirit the gift of God, the spirit of love, uniting the Father and the Son. So it's the Trinity, which is the fundamental mystery constituting our Christian faith. And it's the Trinity from which all the mysteries unfold. I've listed a few of the aspects of Christian doctrine, which we study in theology here. Of course, this is not exhaustive, and we certainly do not have time to go through each one of them. Come to St. Thomas and take classes uh, in our department. But what I hope to do here is merely to point out the interrelatedness and to underscore how one element illumines the other, and then ultimately how Mary is significant for that inner coherence. So an obvious example of the nexus mysteriorum, generally speaking, is ecclesiology, the study of the church, which cannot be undertaken in isolation or apart from an understanding of Jesus Christ, the head of this mystical body. We don't want a decapitated church. And if we understand the church as the body of Christ, then we can further understand the sacramental ministry of the church as works flowing from the head of the mystical body. So in this image in the corner here, it may be difficult to see, but there are seven streams flowing from this rock, which is a symbol of Peter and St. Peter's Basilica in the background there. These are symbols of the seven sacraments, the refreshing uh, rivers of grace, which flow not directly from the church, but it is through the merits of Christ, the merits he won for us on the cross, the work of redemption, which has now been entrusted to the church, these graces. So in baptism, what happens? 
it is not the minister necessarily who is directly baptizing, but it is Christ. Or in confession, it's not the priest who is absolving our sins, but it's the power of Christ working through his ordained minister to touch us with the grace of divine forgiveness, and so on. So we need to see the church within the full nexus with, in relationship to all of the mysteries and centrally to the mystery of Jesus Christ. Similarly, if we look at theological anthropology, who is a human person before God? What does God intend man to be? We must necessarily look to Jesus Christ as the perfect man. And as Vatican II has taught us in Gaudium et Spes, that favorite passage of Pope St. John Paul II, quote, it is only in the mystery of the incarnate word that the mystery of man takes on light. We only understand ourselves properly through the lens of the mystery of the incarnation and of the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. Any anthropology which claims to be Christian and theological must look to the horizons of Christ's resurrected glory. So what happens when we put Mary into the picture? A 1988 letter from the Congregation of Catholic Education entitled The Virgin Mary in Intellectual and Spiritual Formation teaches plainly that, quote, Mary is not a peripheral figure in our faith and in the panorama of theology. Rather, she, through her intimate participation in the history of salvation, in a certain way, unites and mirrors within herself the central truths of the faith. Additionally, the significance of Mary for the Nexus Mysteriorum has been echoed and expounded by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI in various contexts, especially in his reflections on the Mariology of the Second Vatican Council. He says, and I quote, Mariology underscores the Nexus Mysteriorum, the intrinsic interwovenness of the mysteries in their irreducible mutual otherness and their unity. In other words, everything that is said of Mary is said with reference to Jesus Christ and in connection with the mysteries of our faith in him. Mary is the mother of Jesus and the catechism, catechism paragraph 487 teaches us that what the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ and what it teaches about Mary illumines in turn its faith in Christ. A quintessential example is the dogma of the divine maternity, Mary's virginal conception of Jesus, which the catechism says is accessible only in faith, a faith which, under, which understands in it the connection of the mysteries with one another in the totality of Christ's mysteries. What the church believes about Mary's divine motherhood cannot be understood apart from the full nexus of the mysteries of Christ. As you may recall, the doctrine of Mary as the mother of God or Theotokos God-bearer, was promulgated very early on at the Council of Ephesus in 431. The, contra at the controversy at hand then was not necessarily about Mary, but rather it was about the unity of Christ as one person. It was a Christological controversy, which inevitably played out in Marian terms. Mary is not simply Christotokos, the mother of the human Christ, as Nestorius asserted, but truly the mother of God. Theotokos. Why? Because she does not simply bear forth a human nature, but rather she bears forth the person of Jesus Christ, who is the eternal word made flesh and a hypostatic union of two natures, human and divine. Mariology is important to Christology. Her divine motherhood ensures the essence of the incarnation of the word of God. Being born of a woman guarantees that Christ is truly indeed human. He has a human mother. And yet being born of a virgin evidences that he is divine. There is no human intervention here. There's no seed of man. This is entirely God's initiative. Now this close association between Mary and her son is evidenced in the very first announcement of the good news, the hope of salvation in Genesis 3.15, also known as the Proto-Evangelium, Proto-First Evangelium Good News. So immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve, God pronounces to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. They will strike at your head while you strike at their heel. We understand the they as referring to the woman and her offspring, Jesus Christ. It's Mary and Jesus. Based on this verse, Mary is often depicted in paintings and statues, as the painting you see here, as stepping on the head of the serpent. Well, one famous Renaissance painter, Caravaggio, 
exercises artistic license in his depiction of the Proto-Evangelium, which is a bit dramatic and unconventional, but it captures an important meaning. It's Mary and Jesus together who crush the head of the serpent, the symbol of evil. The painting is largely in shadows, but the light focuses on the naked body of the Christ child. He is the focal point, and it is by his power that Mary tramples the serpent. And you see that in um, Zoom and here. Moving forward in time, what is promised here in the Proto-Evangelium is brought to a peak in the event of the Annunciation, a pivotal event in human history. This is the moment of the word made flesh, marking the beginning of a new era, a new creation. The angel Gabriel greets Mary, rejoice, O you who are full of grace, the Lord is with you. Taken in an ordinary context, rejoice might appear as an ordinary greeting. Uh, but within the context of the background of the Old Testament, this is no normal hello. The same word which Luke uses here, kyre, appears four times in the Greek text of the Old Testament, each time all referring to the announcement of messianic joy. So we find in, in Zephaniah, for example, the prophet saying, shout for joy, daughter Zion, sing joyfully, Israel, be glad and exult with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty savior who will rejoice over you with gladness and renew you in his love. The angel's greeting indicates that Mary is the beloved daughter Zion, to whom God's promises of old were made and are now fulfilled. God has taken up his dwelling in her and he will indeed dwell among his people and renew them in his love. This is cause for jubilation, the end breaking of the messianic era. This Marian scene also directly informs theological anthropology. Who is man in relationship to God? In Mary's yes, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your will, her fiat. In her yes, grace and human freedom come to a supreme expression never yet found. We see in her a harmony in which grace builds on and elevates nature. Mary's free and perfect cooperation in the work of salvation, her free will assent to God's message, does not negate her nature or her personhood, but it highlights how she is totally open and receptive to God's grace, giving herself entirely to God's plan, holding nothing back. This sacred moment, hidden from the eyes of the world and in which the eternal word of God becomes enfleshed in Mary, marks the beginning of a new creation. Speaking of creation, we recall the story of creation in Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, this verse is echoed in the prologue to John's gospel, in the beginning was the word. And this prologue comes to a climax in verse 14, in the word became flesh. The same spirit of God, which brooded over the primordial waters at the dawn of creation, also overshadows Mary. And this start of a new creation in her is brought to a fulfillment in the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles in the upper room on Pentecost. Just as Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, so now the church is born through the Holy Spirit, and Mary is an integral figure in both events. We turn then to Mary's significance for the church. Mary's identification with the daughter Zion, the bridal people of God, extends to the new people of God, such that everything that is said of the ecclesia, the church, is also true of Mary. For example, St. Paul draws out the typology of Christ as the new Adam. The church fathers followed Paul, identifying the church as the new Eve. So you see here in this uh, beautiful illuminated manuscript, Jesus, um, sorry, the first Adam who is in his slumber, God the father in his royal robes, draws from Adam's side his rib and fashions Eve. In the New Testament, we have the new Adam who is in his slumber, at the tree of the cross. And God draws from his side. What comes from his side? But water and blood. These are the symbols of the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, symbols or sacraments of initiation. This is a symbol of the church. So the church is the new Eve at the side of Adam. And Irenaeus, a very early apologist, contrasted the disobedience of the first Eve to the perfect obedience of Mary. And he is the first of many to identify Mary as the new Eve alongside the church. 
Moreover, the coalescence of Mary and the church as the virgin bride points to the sinless significance of Mary as the Immaculate Conception. The Blessed Virgin is preserved from all sin by the sheer gratuity of the divine act of preemptive redemption. Overflowing with God's favor, she is preserved from the stain of original sin in order that she might be the mother of God, in order for her to give that perfect yes to God, holding nothing back. Analogously, through the Paschal Mysteries, the church is cleansed and sanctified in order to be born in spirit and in truth, that she too may transmit the life of faith, pure and undefiled. Christ gave his life for the church, says uh, Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, that, quote, he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present himself, the, the church, in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Here we glimpse an insight from Matthias Schieben, a German, <clears throat> excuse me, a German theologian and mystic on the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, promulgated in 1854 by Pope Pius IX, in Ephabulus Deus teaches. And the essential line is, the most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preser was preserved immune from all stain of original sin. Now, Matthias Schieben, writing in 1870, noted a fertile and striking analogy between the absolute purity of the Immaculate Virgin Mary as the sedis sapientiae, the seat of wisdom, in the dogma of the infallibility of the Holy See, the absolute purity of the Cathedra Sapientia. And as you um, may note, this is a, should be a familiar image. It's the image of the statue that we have of Our Lady in uh, St. Basil Chapel on uh, St. Thomas's campus. So it is indeed the statue of Sedis Sapientia, Mary as the seat of wisdom. So Mary's immaculate conception is mirrored in the church's own purity of faith and teaching. Papal infallibility on the flip side is not about the glorification of papal power, but rather in view of Mary, we understand infallibility as a divine gift of God to the church in order to preserve the truths of our salvation pure and undefiled. There is also an inherent link between Mary's motherhood to Jesus and her maternal role toward the church as the body of Christ. Mary's maternity is the paradigm of the church's own motherhood. The church gives birth to Christians in the, at the baptismal font. Returning to that earlier image of the church and the sacraments, we can note the parallel that exists between Mary's maternal mediation of grace and the church's sacramental mediation of grace, which is no less maternal. What I'm getting at here is that the sacraments are not mechanical rites. It's not as if, if we have the right matter and form, uh, the right words and the, the right format um, that we can expect to obtain the grace that we desire. But rather, in view of Mary, we can understand the church's sacra sacramental ministry as truly maternal. The church is Holy Mother Church, and she engenders and nurtures the life of Christ within us. Lastly, let's turn to the greatest sacrament of all. So not only does Mother Church give birth to us at the... Um, baptismal font, but she also nurtures us with the Eucharist. So in the Holy Eucharist, how might we draw out the significance of Mary for our Eucharistic faith? I offer you three points for meditation. The first is at the Last Supper, in which Jesus commanded his apostles to do this in remembrance of me. He is instituting not only the Eucharist as a sacrament, but also the sacrament of holy orders. Do this in remembrance of me. We cannot help but hear here an echo of Mary's mandate at the wedding feast of Cana, directing us to Jesus, indeed, to do whatever he tells us to do. Secondly, Jesus's words of institution, those sacred words, this is my body given up for you. These words could justly be attributed to Mary just as well. She gave her body to our savior. And further at the foot of the cross, when Mary holds the broken body of her son, indeed, this is my body, she could say. This is my son, the body given up for you, for us. Thirdly, 
as we approach this awesome, sacred Paschal banquet every time we attend Mass and we uh, get in line for communion, we respond to this is the body of Christ. We respond, amen. Yes, I believe, so be it. Is this amen not enabled by that first amen uttered by Mary in her fiat to the angel Gabriel? Indeed it is. And the most fruitful reception of communions are those which are taken with the disposition of Mary's perfect yes, so that the word may be born in her, so that the word may be born in us and into our world. There are many more connections between Mary and the whole of Christian doctrine, such as the assumption of Mary into heaven as an eschatological eschatological icon of the church and of our own destiny, body and soul, resurrected, or the typology of Mary and the Ark of the Covenant, a very important typology which embraces all of the Old Testament and brings it into the new, bringing it to fulfillment. But given the limitations of our time together, I will conclude with one further paradigm for your reflection. And it is this distinction between fetus quae and fetus qua, a distinction made by St. Augustine in, in his discussion of the Trinity, in which he says, certainly we affirm with full truth that the faith which is etched in the heart of everyone who believes proceeds from a single doctrine, but it is one thing what we believe and another thing the faith with which we believe. Fetus quae creditor, creditor refers to the contents of what is believed. Fetus qua creditor refers to the faith by which one believes, the total entrustment of oneself to God. Now, one caveat here, and that is this pairing or this distinction of the fetus quae and fetus qua does not imply that there are two separate forms of faith, each which can exist without the other. Rather, there are two inseparable aspects of the one unique virtue of faith. So fetus quae, again, indicates the doctrinal content that is believed, and fetus qua indicates the personal act of faith, the faith by which one relates to God. It goes without saying that it is not sufficient to, to simply know the doctrines, fetus quae, without a personal entrustment of oneself to God, fetus qua. Now, in speaking of Mary in the Nexus Mysteriorum, I have been highlighting the contents of the Christian faith, the fetus quae. But in addition to this, we can also, and we should also consider the fetus qua, the faith by which we believe um, in light of Mary's own pilgrimage of faith, Mary's own fetus qua, informing our fetus qua. So my focus here will be that verse in Luke's gospel, which tells us that Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. Verse 19 of chapter two comes at the end of the nativity scene after the angels have glorified God the Most High and the shepherds have paid their homage to the newborn king. Mary sees all of this. And Luke tells us, Mary treasures these things and ponders them in her heart. Fast forward 22 verses in another episode. After Mary finds the boy Jesus in the temple, preaching to the elders in her bewilderment, this is an episode filled with frantic searching for him, the relief of finding him, and then this incomprehensible and comprehension at his words. Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Well, here Luke again tells us, his mother kept all these things in her heart. So Mary's disposition to the mysteries of Christ, which she experienced firsthand, both of all and of incomprehension, is a disposition of faith, humble faith, taking a posture of contemplation. In contemplation, we do not just look, but rather we see deeply. Perception confers communion. And when we look with contemplative love, like lovers who gaze upon each other, the understanding which opens up before us is akin to knowledge as an act of love itself. Contemplative knowing does not seek to possess or to dominate, to dissect or to interrogate, but rather to participate in the mysteries that are known. If we wish to do theology as seeking truth in the tradition, we would do well and be well advised to take on Mary's contemplative gaze, a gaze of love imbued by the spirit, praying and pondering the mysteries which we study. Pope Pius X referred to Mary as the vanquisher of all heresies, indeed the immaculate one, who is free from all stain of sin 
and free from all contagion of body, soul, and intellect, is the best teacher who draws us into the mysteries. Mary has a vital role in the nexus mysteriorum of Christian doctrine, and we contemplate within her that nexus so that her faith might also inform our own. I will end with a final scripture verse. Before that, I have here De Filius again, referring to that relationship of faith and reason in which reason should seek persistently, piously, and soberly. Mary assists our reason in this endeavor. The final verse is John 19, 27. It is at the foot of the cross in which Jesus, before his last breath, looks down at his beloved apostle and his mother. And he says to his mother, behold your son. And to the apostles, or the apostle John, he says, behold your mother. This is the moment in which Jesus gives his mother to us. She becomes the mother of the church. She becomes our mother. The tendency has been to focus on, behold your mother. This is indeed our mother now. I would like to invite you to shift your focus just a bit and to shift it towards the behold. Behold, look at Mary, turn to Mary, pray to Mary, learn to love Jesus and her, to love truth with the eyes and the heart of Mary. Thank you. Thank you so much, sister, for that really rich and uh, thoughtful reflection. There's really, there's, there's so much there for us to, to talk about. Uh, do, you, do you have time for a few questions? Yes, absolutely. So now I would, I would invite everybody, you can uh, feel free, if you're on Zoom, you can throw a question in the chat box and we'll get it. Or if you're on Facebook or YouTube, I know we have some, some uh, parish young adult watch groups that have been tuning in regularly. Feel free to throw a question in the YouTube or the Facebook uh, thread and we'll try to get to those as well. Okay, sister, let's see here. Um, first of all, what can we read? Is there anything that, that you can recommend that we, that we read to deepen our understanding of this theology of Mary? Let me, let me bring two questions together here. To uh, uh, deepen our understanding of this theology of Mary. Also, what can we read or listen to deepen our relationship with, with Mary as mother of God? Indeed, I thought you might ask that question. So I did pull some books <laughs> from my shelf. Uh, there's uh, so much uh, rich literature to look at. I tend towards the more theological a bit, but I can, I can show you what I put off my shelf. In terms of the tradition of the church in more recent theology, um, there is the Resourcement tradition in which um, prior to Vatican II and at the time of Vatican II, the church reached back into its uh, rich resources of uh, the scriptures and the church fathers. So something I had on my shelf was, uh, very famously, Hugo Rahner, the brother of um, Karl Rahner, um, wrote Our Lady in the Church. And here we have the quintessential um, patristic ressourcement, um, presenting the patristic ideas uh, with regard to Mary. Now, we have this as part of our tradition, the living tradition now, within the church post-Vatican II. But at the time in the 50s, uh, this was something that was new, and uh, Hugo Rahner makes a splash there. I also love John Henry Newman, and he was also a very patristic man. So we have here Mary the Second Eve, uh, that patristic image of Mary as the new Eve or the second Eve. So John Henry Newman would be a wonderful source to look at. In terms of what the um, Vatican um, Council, Second Vatican Council does, the newest and the best theological source today would be Cavadini's uh, work. There was a conference at uh, University of Notre Dame a few years ago and it was focused entirely on Mary on the eve of the Second Vatican Council. So this is from Notre Dame um, Press. And along with that, a work that I continually go back to, um, a profound writing by two um, huge minds, two great theologians, uh, Pope uh, Benedict Emeritus, Benedict XVI, um, co-authored, or it's really a collection of, of their essays published together, we have here um, Joseph Ratzinger and Hans Urs von at, uh on Mary the Church at the Source. So this is an amazing work. Um, uh, much of the, the discussion on Mary at Vatican II can be found here, at least in seminal form. And then I would all, always recommend going back to what the church teaches herself. Um, 
two documents from um, the magisterium would be Marial Marialis Cultus by Pope um, Paul VI, uh, right after the Vatican Council addressing the issues of Mariology, and then um, Pope St. John Paul II's Redemptorist Mater. And then we also have writings from our um, local Conference of Catholic Bishops. This is Mary in the Church, a selection of teaching, teaching documents from the USCCB. And then I also thought, oh, I should, I should pull this off my shelf too. Um, and it is the year of Dante. It's the 700th anniversary of his death from 1321 and it's now 2021. Um, so I, I got this book, I haven't yet cracked it open, but this is Ralph McInerney's Dante and the Blessed Virgin Mary. So another poetic or artistic approach um, to the Virgin Mary. And I often find that's the, the, the most mystically oriented because when we, when we want to come close to the mysteries of our faith, um, sometimes words lose their power or reason yields to the mystery. And the best way to express the mystery uh, is sometimes in, in poetry uh, or in literature. So those are a few things that um, I, I would recommend. Yes. Sister, that was an A plus presentation, literature review. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna next year, I'm gonna send a little clip of this out to the other speakers. <laughs> I'm saying this is what sister did. So uh, that's really, really helpful. I mean, what, what, a, uh, what a range of, uh, I remember reading uh, Hugo Rahner's book. I, that was the first thing on Mary I ever read so many years ago. And I, and I knew, oh, there's a lot of things, there's a lot going on here, but I'm not exactly sure what it all means, like what he's doing and what, what the, how these currents are, are developing and playing out. And, and that's, uh, you know, what a, what a fascinating, what a beautiful book. It really oh. is, yes. Um, I remember, here's an aside, I remember, I think it was uh, Cardinal Dulles, and he was a cardinal by this point, he gave a talk, and I think it was at Fordham, and it, it was, it was, he was an ecclesiology talk, Father Fessio was there, he was a great, of course, a disciple of uh, Henry de Lubach and von Balthasar, and, uh, and uh, Father, uh, Father Fessio, you know, really kind of went at him and say, well, wait a second, you didn't, you, you, you failed to mention anything about the Blessed Virgin in this talk. And this is a real, this is, you know, you're a real short sight here. <laughs> right. And this tends to happen very frequently. Um, if you just look at an ecclesiology textbook, there may be, um, if Mary's lucky, a paragraph on Mariology. And what we actually have at the Vatican Council is a, a very, um, ecclesiocentric Mariology or a Marian ecclesiology. And yet that has not been received by the, the um, theological circles, I should say. I, I think Mariology or Marian piety at least is a lot, very much alive in many circles of the faithful. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to retrieve and fully receive what the council has bequ bequeathed to us um, on Mary and the church. So Mary does really kind of um, interpenetrate all the disciplines of theological study. And we should um, we should avail ourselves of the richness of the mysteries there. Yeah. That, so that that's that brings me up to there's a question down here. I'm going to skip to this because I think it's a good segue. Um, what happened? You obviously you know the rank and file laity know that there's been some kind of depreciation or this loss of Marian devotion. And so the question is, what happened in recent in recent decades, and what do we do as the rank and file laity to try to help restore devotion to Our Lady? Well, coming to talks like these and other Marian events um, is a start. So continually, continuing to be faithful um, to, uh, to looking to Mary and um, being devout and, and, and practicing Marian devotion is a way to enliven one's faith and to live it more fully. And then in the um, intellectual uh, realm, then indeed um, learning about Mary, studying Mariology. Actually, I didn't bring up this book. This is, this is a wonderful uh, brand new book that came out last year from CUA Press, um, Manfred Hoff, the, An Introduction to Theology. If I were to teach a course in Mariology, I would very likely use something like this. Um, and by that, I, uh, what I'm trying to say is to, to study Mary, to understand um, what Mariology entails and what the church teaches and has taught, what the rich tradition is, and also, Along with that, is not, it's not simply looking at um, uh, what Vatican II has taught, but actually doing the work of Grace Horse Simon, going back to the tradition as well. 
And so in race or small, we go back to scripture and the church fathers. And in so doing, this becomes perhaps common ground in which we can speak to our Protestant brethren uh, about Mary, where this has been a church dividing issue for many Christian denominations, it need not be. Because if we go back to scripture, that's common ground. If we go back to the church fathers, we're looking at the, the church's views on Mary um, prior to the division of the church, or at least the Protestant Reformation, which comes centuries later. So there, there is a fertile ground for so much development um, in terms of um, the theological circles, what, what needs to be done. Um, so there is, is lots of work here, yes. That's fantastic. Okay, Catherine asks, Sister, would you please explain the issue of Mother Mary's title of Mediatrix? Why is there a disputation about this title? And indeed there was. Probably the most heated disputation in a very um, formal context would have been at the Second Vatican Council itself. And this is where we find um, the council at its most uh, divisive point. It was actually the question on Mary. And you would think, well, what's the big deal about Mary? Why are the church fathers? And here we, this is, you know, um, inner Catholic uh, discussion. Why would the church fathers find uh, it so difficult to find unanimity on the question of Mary? Indeed, they were so divided over, with over 2,000 votes on a question about where to have the Marian treaties. Uh, the fathers were divided by merely 40 votes, a 40 vote difference. And the reason we have chapter eight of Lumen Gentium addressing Mary instead of a separate treatise on Mary is because of this, uh, this vote that happened at the council. This is to say that the question of Mary uh, was very uh, contentious. And at the heart of this was really um, mediatrics. That was a big part of it, at least one big slice of it. So it needs to be seen in the larger context. And the larger context is the church's efforts in ecumenism. It would seem that um, promoting these new, new titles um, that put forward the privileges of Mary would further distance or um, remove the Catholic Church from ecumenical dialogue. And so uh, mediatrics was brought up at the council. And if you read Lumen Gentium chapter eight carefully, it does actually show up in Lumen Gentium. So the, the Vatican Council does employ mediatrics though in a modified version. The very Marian maximalist um, council fathers wanted to say that Mary is the mediatrix of all graces. The council tempered that and said that Mary is indeed mediatrix along with adjutrix and a few other titles kind of lumped together so as not to point the spotlight on Mary as mediatrix alone. The idea here is indeed that um, Protestants might, might hear mediatrics as a, um, a taking away from the me one mediation of Christ, Christ as the sole mediator of salvation. So indeed, Mary is a mediation of grace, but there's only one mediation of salvation. Mary's mediation, when we pray to Mary, so intercession is a form of mediation, and we pray to Mary, we pray to the saints, they don't have their own mediatory source. Rather, they participate in the one mediatory power of Jesus Christ. And the council underscores this and explains it very well. If we looked at the documents themselves and the redaction forms, um, there were extensive paragraphs that were added, which still remain in what we have in Lumen Gentium today. So it is a disputed title, although it's not one that the church has cast aside and it has only modified it for um, reasons of mainly ecumenism. That's what, what a uh, ec excellent um, summary. I, I'm sure that's, that's really helpful, Catherine. Um, this is, let me go on to the next one here. This, this next question kind of makes me look over your, your right shoulder to the Immaculate Heart there. Uh, it's a good question that probably many of our listeners have. Um, how has reflecting on the Nexus Mysteriorum enhanced your prayer life? How can it improve mine? Yes, indeed. So I pray as a Dominican sister, I pray as a Christian, um, a daughter of God, uh, and I pray also as a theologian. I think all of that comes together uh, with my, um, my focus on this nexus mysteriorum. When I 
do my theology uh, and I, I do systematic, I do dogmatics. So I teach the courses for undergraduates at uh, St. Thomas. I teach the core teachings of the Catholic church, which is basically catechism. Uh, and then for the majors, I have Trinity, Christology, Ecclesiology. Um, so core dogmatic courses. Basically, I look at uh, the tenets of our Christian faith. And to do so for me, to, to do theology, dogmatic theology in a Marian key enhances it entirely. It brings it to a whole nother level. It brings it, and I was trying to share this with you when I spoke of contemplative love, Mary's stance of contemplation, how she encounters the mysteries. She, she lived in, in perfect union with the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She knew Jesus firsthand. She bore him in her womb. Um, she, she carried him in her arms as a child and as a, a dead body, right? So what we study in theology, Mary has a firsthand experience and account of. And so when I approach my theological work, um, attempting to take on the disposition of Mary, I find that it helps me to plunge into um, a more well-rounded theology that is not only rational, because we are rigorously applying our reason, to reflect on and to understand um, the co coherence of our faith. But it also um, makes it so enjoyable because it brings me to, um, to a deeper prayer and a, a real contemplation and meditation of the mysteries of the faith. And so how might the Nexus Mysteriorum enhance your prayer life? I would say um, uh, the way prayer happens is just plunge into it, right? Um, just, just give it a try. And in, uh, apart from theology, so uh, another practice that I have um, that engages Mary, which I found radically transformed my spiritual life, was to receive Holy Communion, um, asking Mary to help you welcome Jesus into your heart in the same way that she welcomed him into her life. So um, in line for communion and after communion in your thanksgiving, uh, ask Mary to assist you because Mary was sinless. So she, she knows how to love God perfectly and how to please God, and she can help us in that way. And then if I can jump back to the uh, theological aspect, if you are writing a dissertation, I found great inspiration in asking Mary to, uh, to help um, my words become flesh in the same way the word became flesh in her as I, I work on producing um, uh, theological writing to look to Mary and to pray to her um, actually was quite a support and an inspiration uh, and um, yeah, a, a strength, an anchor for me in that work. So just a few ideas throwing out there. That's Thank you uh, for the question, yeah. No, it's a great question. I'm, I'm sure, you know, we just read in, uh, we uh, three, Dr. Hayes and Dr. Smith and I taught this summer one uh, theology of education. And we read, I'm sure a book that I'm sure you know well, uh, Father Sertelange's On the Intellectual Life. and the response was just overwhelming. And my, my point is, as you were, your comments made me think of this, is even just, you, you said earlier, well, come study theology with me, with the department at UST, because really theology, and especially the way we teach it, where we do a lot of primary texts, it should be this contemplative endeavor, right? I mean, it, it should be a kind of prayer. And that's, of course, what Father Sertelange thinks it is. And it's, of course, much more that. And um, yeah, I think, uh, thank you for those, for those comments. Do you have, Sister, yes. do you have one more? Do you, no, do you want to say something about Father Sertelange? Oh, yes. I just wanted to mention that he's Dominican. Yes. Um, I share <laughs> the Dominican tradition. And um, our, our charism is um, what St. Thomas describes, he, who was a Dominican, describes the charism as um, to contemplate and to uh, share with others the fruits of your contemplation. And so I, I find that this is what theology is. It's first contemplation in order to share in my teaching or for priests in their teaching and preaching um, what they have contemplated. And so I think Father Sertelange um, in writing The Intellectual Life was really putting forward a Dominican spirituality um, with you know, emphasis on the intellectual side. It's an yeah. excellent book. Uh, that would be um, number one recommendation for anyone who starts any form of study. Yeah. 
it is we we were when father dempsey was on maybe six weeks ago or something we were getting ready and i said oh father dempsey we're just reading on the intellectual life father Serge Lange, and uh the students are just raving about it and he's sitting there and he pulls out a he pulls out his copy he says it's always right next to my desk wow nice so if you haven't read that you need to you, you have to read it. it it's a it's a must it's a it's a must you actually just answered one of our questions about uh also the implications for eucharistic spirituality um, so, but do you have time for one more sister? Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, hang on. Yeah. So let me see here. Um, well, all right. We have, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to kind of bend your patience. We have another, we have another one that came in. And I think is worth getting in here too. First of all, thanks sister. In reference to your book, Mary as mother of communion and the sacrament of salvation, how do we come to the truth that we are actually drawing out the truth and not merely putting in truth, uh, uh, basically like, uh, i.e., uh, eisegesis versus exegesis. So I think, yeah. Okay, um, so maybe I'll take that in two parts. Yeah. Um, so drawing out the truth instead of putting in the truth. I, uh, when, when we come to the truth, we want to partake in the truth uh, versus manipulating it. Should I draw it out? Should I put it in? Um, it's, it's me entering into the truth that, that comes to me. Now, very often um, in reading Dei Verbum, no, it's Lumen Gentium, um, and I, I, I don't have the exact words, but uh, there's this idea that appears in Lumen Gentium about truth, and I, I expound it in class, and, and the idea here is that when we come to the truth, very often in our postmodern world, we want to, to judge the truth. We want to say, oh, that's, um, that's good, but not for me. Or uh, I don't agree with that. You can have your truth as long as, you know, we don't interfere with each other's lives and we don't inconvenience each other. That's fine. That's not actually the proper approach to truth. When we come to the truth, we don't judge the truth. The truth judges us. So when we come to the truth, it's not about us manipulating the truth. Let me draw out the truth let me, or let me make up my own truth. But rather, in reality, when we come to the truth, the truth will judge us. So in order to have a good judgment, then we want to partake in the truth. So that when we come to truth, then there's something uh, we find kinship and we enter into the truth. I know that's a rather abstract answer, um, but I think it's important to consider truth in abstract ways. Um, and then in a more concrete uh, way, the second half I thought I would, I would comment on is eisegesis versus exegesis. Um, I think the very straightforward answer here would be to um, immerse ourselves in the living tradition of the church. What does mother church teach? Um, it is very easy and, and we see this in um, the middle ages in which there is a proliferation of um, spiritual readings of scripture and it, it became very creative in some ways. And so in our postmodern world, we've kind of swung away from that and we are very rational in our approach to scripture. Um, historical critical um, methodologies. There's actually, uh, there should be a medium uh, between these two extremes. And uh, the church provides us with the guidelines. So am I doing eisegesis in how I read scripture? Well, how does mother church read scripture? How, am I, how, what, how did the church fathers read these passages? How has this been sanctioned um, uh, by the magisterium uh, versus my own uh, creative invention of uh, a new reading? That's always, uh, that's always uh, flags a question mark um, when an undergraduate term paper comes up with a brand new reading of, of scripture. Um, so yes, we do want to avoid eisegesis. We do want to do authentic exegesis, spiritual and, um, and literal exegesis uh, and according to the teachings of the church. So go back to those uh, criteria uh, that Dei Verbum puts forward for us, and then there are many documents from the PBC um, on uh, historical critical methods and the, the orthodox parameters in which to exercise that. Mm -hmm. We had, so if you haven't seen uh, Father Dempsey's talk uh, right on Dei Verbum 12, and also Dr. Summer hit on this as well, you go back and see our, our earlier videos because they did a great job, and, and Sister, I'm delighted that you that you mentioned this. And of course, you're a, you have a great love for Newman. You're directing one of our, our master's theses on Newman right now. And I was thinking as you were saying that, I mean, Newman is kind of the, like the incarnation of like the Dei Verbum 12 approach 
where, you know, he's deep in tradition and, you know, his, his docility, right. In a sense is, is, you know, force forcing him out of a certain icy Jesus to an authentic exegesis with the fathers. Right. I mean, could we mm -hmm. say that about Newman? Yes, absolutely. I'd, I'd agree entirely. Newman was so um, docile to the truth that he would go wherever the truth led him and the truth led him to the Catholic church against all of his natural instincts. Mm -hmm. um, being raised Anglican and being a an Anglican clergyman. Um, so uh, a wonderful uh, patron that we have in, in John Henry Newman. All right, sister, I know, th I appreciate your, your, your time here. L last question here. Okay, how does the term nexus mysteriorum compare or contrast with the term typology? And similarly, how do the terms body of Christ and Holy Mother Church compare or contrast? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Very, a uh, very two, two very different questions. Yeah. Right. Um, they, they were in the same one, but we could, we can break those down first. Uh, let me reread that first one again. Cause there's a lot there. Yes. How does the term nexus mysteriorum compare or contrast with the term typology? It's an interesting question. Yeah. Okay. So typology is uh, what we see the church fathers exercising quite a bit when they saw parallels, um, uh, so here we're looking at spiritual interpretation of scripture. Uh, we're looking at really alleg the allegorical sense in which um, there are types in the Old Testament which find their fulfillment in the New Testament. Ultimately, we have types of, of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, and in the New Testament, we have the fulfillment in him. So Christ as the uh, new Moses or Christ as the new Adam or Christ as the new, the, the David, Davidic figure, right? So that's typology, um, and it's not unrelated to the nexus mysteriorum, though I would cast the nexus mysteriorum more broadly and say that here we are looking at the interconnectivity of all aspects of, of the Christian faith. So we're not simply looking at the allegorical interpretation of scripture, but rather we're looking at the, all the tenets of, of doctrine. So that would be part one. And then part two, with regard to the terms, the body of Christ and the body, that term in itself has um, undergone many different interpretations. The church fathers early on and um, in this time of St. Paul, we see body of Christ referring to um, what we think today. When we think body of Christ, do you think Eucharist or do you think the church as the mystical body of Christ? We tend to think that. But for the very early Christians, body of Christ referred to the church. It, at the turn of the first millennia, what we had was a shift in these terms and body of Christ, which signified the, the, the church, the members of the church, the body of Christ, were referred to as the body of Christ. So when Paul uh, had his conversion experience, and um, a light shines on him and a voice speaks to him from heaven and says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Um, Paul says, well, who are you? I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting those Christians. So what we have here is an understanding of the early church in which Christ identifies himself with the members of the church whom Christ was persecuting. I'm sorry, whom Paul was persecuting. So body of Christ refers to us Christians. At the turn of the, the first millennium, what we have then is um, challenges in the, the faith of the Christians in the Eucharist. So we had Christians, even priests, who were um, tempted in their, in their Eucharistic faith to say, well, is this really uh, the presence of Christ? And so church teaching swung to, the, it swung to a different approach and emphasized that the Eucharist is the body of Christ. So today we have this emphasis on the real presence of Christ, such that the real presence for us now refers to the Eucharist and the church is referred to as the mystical body. For the early Christians, the church is not the mystical body. The church is the body. The church is the body of Christ. So even in uh, the first part of the question uh, asking about the term body of Christ, we have um, different understandings, different, uh, a, a progression of the way the, the terms are used. Um, that's body of Christ. And then Holy Mother Church. Holy Mother Church is 
not so common today, I, I, or at least I don't hear it used as often, though I have used it in my talk. Um, but it refers to a very important reality that the church is indeed mother. St. Paul says this in his letter to the Galatians. He refers to the church as our mother. And, and we don't want to lose sight of this. We don't want to look at the church as a mere institution, like the, the code um, chair of St. Peter, uh, all the way in Rome, far distant from me. Uh, if you've never been to Rome, you've never been to mother church in a sense. That's not what we want. We want to understand the church and the full mystery of the church and the church um, as mother as the mother who engenders us, engenders the life of grace within us, the mother who nurtures us, the mother who disciplines us when uh, we get out of line, and the mother who forgives our sins and binds our wounds, the mother who, um, who, who cares for us. And we want to belong to this tender mother. Everyone, everyone has a mother, and I, I want to say everyone loves their mother, uh, but um, uh, human mothers um, uh, are flawed, and sometimes there is pain involved in our relationships with our mothers. But the, the idea of motherhood is, is tender and dear. It's, it's the closest union of um, two human bodies uh, when a mother bears forth a, a child from her womb. So the church is truly our mother in a spiritual way. So not obviously not a biological birth, but in the spiritual birth, um, collaborating with the mystery of Christ as he has entrusted it to the church uh, to bring forth this life in us. Um, so Holy Mother Church, and does uh, indeed, as Mother Church, she is the bride of Christ, and as a bride, she unites herself to Jesus Christ and becomes one with him. So if you think of the uh, image of marital love, what happens when a bride and groom come together and unite themselves in love, they are one body. And so um, in ecclesiology, we have these two images, the church as bride, but as bride, she comes into union with her bridegroom and she becomes one body with him. Sister, that's fantastic. Um, Michael wrote in and said, dear sister Nguyen, I can't wait to go back and watch this again. And on that note, mm -hmm. we can remind you that yes, that this uh, will be, we'll, we'll be promoting this talk sister. It'll, it'll be up on, on YouTube and also on Facebook and we'll be promoting it. it what a fantastic reflection. There is really so much here. And uh, I mean, I completely understand why, uh, some of the viewers are saying, hey, I want to watch this again, because I mean, there's, there's really a, uh, a really such a, a profound and deep reflection. So thank you, sister, so much for, you know, uh, giving up your time. I know you're busy and I know you have a lot going on. I know you're tremendously swamped with things, but we really appreciate you coming on. Certainly my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You are followed up next week. I'm going to, I'm going to put this up right now. Next week, uh, be sure not to miss our um, former chair, now associate dean, Dr. Uh, Hayes, Dr. Andrew Hayes. And of course, Dr. Hayes specializes, his great theological love is St. Ephraim. Oh, and I just clicked out of it. Hang on. I'm not going to give up. We're going to, we, 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 we have to hang on. All right. We, the marketing department spent, spent way too much time on this. There we go. We have a, we have a uh, fantastic marketing department. Okay. Um, and I just need to learn how to do a proper zoom share, which I should be able to do by now. And there it is right there. I'm going to list this up. So next week we have St. Ephraim, the Syrian on knowing God. St. Ephraim is a very important church father. You probably haven't spent a lot of time uh, with, and you might have never heard of him, but this is going to be very interesting. And of course this ties in last week, we had Dr. Harmon on the Western father, St. Augustine, how not to find God clues from the confessions. And so next week will be Dr. Hayes on knowing God. And, you know, sister mentioned, uh, you know, Hey, come and take courses at, at UST. If you want to learn more about this, you know, she mentioned that she, she, she teaches the Trinity. I've seen her. Uh, she has a fantastic reputation as a teacher. I've seen her syllabus on the Trinity. It's a, it's a veritable, uh, you know, kind of garden of delights. It, she just, it's a beautiful sampling of the development of the doctrine of the Trinity through the tradition. Um, and, and this is what we do at UST. I'm still, if you're, if you're interested in going deeper, I'm still getting applications, even though we're halfway through July. And, you know, there's a number of good MA programs that are in person or online. And this is what our specialty is, is taking through, taking people through the primary texts of the tradition, as sister says, always in light 
or, or guided by the principles laid out in Dei Verbum 12, right? Through the tradition, the fathers, the magisterium. That's how we read scripture. So um, feel free to, to, to email, email us or you can contact us on Facebook if you have any questions. We have uh, just a few more weeks left. Thanks to you who have been tuning in, especially sister, you, you, I mentioned this earlier, we have, what, we have young adult watch parties. So thank you for all those who are tuning in. Sister, have a wonderful summer, and it was a real pleasure to see you, and I will see you for sure in August. Yes, thank you again. You're very welcome, sister. Thanks so much.